trigger warning, this show has a lot of graphic violence, death, and suicide. I'll mostly be talking about capitalism though, so trigger warning, capitalism. Squid Game is a South Korean horror and drama series that rose to the top of the Netflix charts for its fun, if cliché premise, gut-wrenching story, and catchy visuals. It's a great show, consistently exciting to watch and with characters you'll really care about. Beyond that, Squid Game is the most devastating piece of mainstream anti-capitalist art I've seen. Now, that's quite a claim. I won't say it's the most elegant or refined or deep, and it certainly falls short in one particular aspect, but it's just so cutting and resentful. It doesn't hold back from facing the most grim realities about our economy, and why they are the way they are. The writer, Huang dong Hyuk has said it was written in a time of personal financial struggle, and that comes through. It captures the struggle of the working class. It shows how systems keep you entrenched and indebted. It shows this both literally and through metaphors simultaneously, which is pretty cool. It jumps between the real world with real problems and this allegorical game, where desperate people compete against their peers as they fight to the death for the tiny chance to become a billionaire. You get it? It's very subtle. Side note, why this video is here. Yes, I am a game developer, and most of my videos are about game development. I just had a lot to say about this show, and I wanted to share my brain pickings with the world. If you are new to my channel, check out my upcoming game, Vertigo 2. Alright, back to business. The series follows main character Seong Gihan, a deeply indebted gambling addict. Like the rest of the players, he is desperate to get any relief from poverty and provide for himself and his family. When he is offered the chance to win billions of won in a mysterious game, he accepts and is kidnapped alongside other potential players. It turns out the game consists of simple children's games, the first of which is Red Light, Green Light. The penalty for losing is being killed on the spot. We follow Gihun and his fellow players through six such games as they are killed off one by one and compete to survive and escape their material circumstances. Through this simple setup, the series deftly explores a wide variety of topics that contribute to the modern struggles of the underclass. In this essay, I want to pick apart what I think are the most important takeaways and prove how much Squid Game really hates capitalism. The series also develops many sympathetic characters and touching relationships, and it is absolutely worth watching just as a drama. I'm not going to talk about that side of things here, but I will end up spoiling plenty of it, so watch the show first if you want to experience it first. One of the unique stipulations of the game's rules is that a majority of players can vote to end it at any time. All survivors go home, but nobody gets the money. After the red light green light massacre and the reveal that the penalty for losing is death, the players understandably call a vote. By a narrow margin, the game is ended. Everyone goes home and returns to their previous lives. But when given the opportunity a few days later, 93% of them return to the game. What? Why would they do that? It's because the choice was not much of a choice to begin with. Outside, in reality, they faced debt, violence, and a struggle to survive all the same, with even less hope to end up as a billionaire. The game selects poor and desperate people, those who will degrade themselves for a chance to escape their circumstances. This is what exploitative employers do, and what the United States military does, to keep a veneer of things being voluntary. This is the reality of a free market. Those in desperate circumstances have no choice but to participate. Take a job that pays badly and treats you worse, or go homeless. Sell your labor, or starve. It is an imbalance of power, where one side owns everything and the other owns nothing. You can't just choose not to take his job at Amazon when the alternative is starvation, but Amazon can certainly choose not to hire you and find another desperate player willing to play in its game for a few bucks. The cruelty is compounded by the fact that the systemic oppression of the poor is orchestrated by the same predators. The government lets education prices skyrocket and then offers you a free ride if you join the military. Big corporations lobby against welfare policies and then hire the desperate for minimum wage and treat them like shit. Those same capital owners are later revealed to be the creators of the game. They produce conditions that funnel workers wherever they want, dangling cash over their heads. A truly free market is made without coercion. For a worker to be able to bargain in a free market, they must be guaranteed to not go hungry even if they refuse to work for an employer who mistreats them. 
The choice is obvious. In the real world, you can't just not play the game of capitalism. There's no socialism button that you can press. You have to participate, sell your labor, or exploit the labor of others. The alternative is starving on the street, and if you do end up on the street, the capitalists will punish you for that too. Meritocracy is a myth upheld by the capital-owning class, and one that is laid bare by the allegory of the game. The rules claim that an even playing field is sacred, repeating this again and again. Those caught cheating are punished with death. But obviously, the field is not even. Many games rely on raw strength, allowing men to dominate, killing women and the weak. This is irreconcilable. Are those with less muscles less deserving of wealth? Is it fair to have the strongest and most violent dominate? This mirrors our society where we claim a meritocracy, but some groups face obvious systemic barriers. Instead of actually evening the playing field, those at the top plug their ears and claim the system is perfectly fair. Furthermore, many of the games are entirely luck-based. In an early game, players have to carefully chip away shapes out of a sugar wafer. Some shapes are easy, like the circle. Some shapes are hopelessly difficult, like the umbrella. In another game, players have to cross a bridge of glass tiles, where each step has a 50-50 chance of being stable or giving away to a deadly fall. This represents the luck needed to succeed in capitalism. If you are born into wealth, it's nearly impossible to fail. You get every advantage in life simply from being born into the right family. If you come into this world in bad circumstances, if you get the umbrella, you're fucked. It is horrible to have dice rolls determine life and death and equally horrible for them to determine if you will suffer poverty forever. Meritocracy is a bogus myth repeated by the people already in power. It implies they have the most merit and deserve to be on top. Moreover, even if we could establish a real meritocracy, it would still result in the less merited falling into poverty, suffering, and oppression. Some people find this unacceptable and have the radical opinion that all humans deserve basic dignity, health care, housing, food. When Putting it that way, it sounds like common sense. Even the Constitution guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But our system currently guarantees none of these in practice, and decries those advocating for them as radical, far-left idealists. Okay, this is one of my favorite things. They just have dudes that get different shapes on their face for what class they represent. Worker with circles, soldier with triangles, and manager with squares in that order. This is a separate little allegory from the main story, as they don't play the games like the players do. They're just there to keep the facility running. The worker class is expendable and treated poorly. They do manual labor, live in cramped conditions, and are given no trust or privileges. They can't even speak without being spoken to. They show mild class consciousness and don't seem to be loyal to the game. Presumably they're here for money, just like the players are. Soldiers are the police. They're essentially just workers given guns. They have the power to execute violence in the name of upholding the system. They police players as well as workers. They have little autonomy themselves and are just arms of the state. I'm going to talk more about police in a bit, so hold tight. The manager class is the bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie means the capital-owning class, those that make a living off the labor of others like landlords and owners of companies. While still ranking far below the game masters, they have significant autonomy and command the soldiers and workers. They are far less numerous as well, which shows the concentration of power at the top. We also see that if they step out of line, even their status is not enough to protect them from the system violently maintaining its structure. Anyway, this is just so cute and on the nose, having these little dudes with their class markers printed on their face. It fits the show really well and reinforces the rigidity of the hierarchy within the game and in the real world. A big subplot follows rogue police officer Huang Junho doing his best to get to the bottom of the game. A good apple, you might say. ki goes to the police after voting to leave the game, but they are shown to be completely apathetic and dismissive of the potential crimes happening. Granted, the game is so silly on its face and well concealed, I didn't blame them too much. This gets more concerning when it turns out the games have been occurring for decades, with hundreds and hundreds of people kidnapped and killed for each one. The police are presented as not caring about the fates of the poor, destitute types of people that end up recruited to the game. 
or even noticing their disappearance, which is pretty accurate. Junho, suspecting his brother to have been kidnapped in a previous game, decides to go AWOL and investigate on his own, secretly following Gihun as he returns to the game. Junho utterly fails to expose the game. He survives for some time disguised as a worker and documents what he can about the inner machinations. When he tries to make his escape though, he is hunted down by the front man and killed. He seems to succeed in leaking some evidence of the games to the police department, but in the ending of the series it is shown that the games are still continuing as usual a full year later. Either this evidence was intercepted and snuffed out by the powers that be, or the police once again failed to act on it properly. We also get some Gihun backstory. At one point, he participated in a labor strike years ago, which police brutally cracked down on and beat his friend to death. Then there's the soldier class, an obvious metaphor for the police of the real world. Class traitors who get a taste of the power as they hold up the system using violence. Squid Game is pretty explicitly anti-cop, with two rock-solid points to make. Number one, the police are pathetically ineffective at stopping serious crime that affects vulnerable people. Number two, the police are super good at violently cracking down on anti-capitalist activity. There's the good cop character Junho, but ultimately it is shown that he is completely unable to use his status as a police officer to do any good. He reflects an idealistic young cop who might join the force genuinely hoping to do good, but soon realizing it's impossible to do good from within. Only options then are to quit or succumb to the system and become a regular bastard cop. Fortunately, our dude seems to realize this early on when he goes rogue. If you are familiar with anti-police thought, you'll know that the police, as they exist now, exist to reinforce the current hierarchy of society, with capital owners on top and laborers on the bottom. From the beginning, police have been slave catchers and strike breakers, and not much more than that. I know next to nothing about South Korean history and society. As a Korean show, Koreans are going to get a lot more out of Squid Game than I am. But I do know that South Korea is one of America's little baby pet capitalism states, one of the more successful ones at that. In return for military aid, usually in the context of the Cold War and against some communists, many nations around the world adopt US-friendly economies and puppet leaders beholden to the CIA. Jesus Christ, I've opened the Wikipedia and I see I need not have bothered. He was elected uncontested in March 1960, after his opponent Cho Byung-ok died before voting day. The opposition rejected the result as rigged, which triggered protests. These escalated into the student-led April Revolution when police shot demonstrators in Masan. As protesters converged on the presidential palace, the CIA covertly flew him out to Honolulu, Hawaii, where he spent the rest of his life in exile. See, I didn't even need to read up on this. The CIA just cannot keep it in their pants, and will do literally anything to oppose what they perceive as the global spread of communism. Anyway, South Korea exists now as an excellent replication of America's hyper-capitalist society, with its economy brute-forced into existence by the US. Meanwhile, global communist movements have been beaten into the dirt, leaving North Korea to languish and descend into a poor, isolated, pathetic state. The point of this is, the South Korean underclass shares many struggles and sufferings with the American underclass. I know very little about Korea, I've never been there, and yet I see the American experience mirrored in Squid Game. Debt is a major economic struggle that affects characters in the show. Being poor and required to pay out of pockets for necessities can lead to taking out loans to survive, then leading to perpetual debt and free interest for the wealthy creditors. Gihun begins the show deeply in debt and struggling just to get enough money for food, much less beginning to pay off what he owes. There's no upward mobility here, and gains are just paid to your creditors. Privatized medical care is expensive as well. With no insurance, Gihun needs to pay exorbitant fees to get medical care for his sick mother. In the end, she dies at home as he is off struggling to win the game and get enough money to admit her to the hospital. Sick people avoiding medical care because of cost is a real issue, and it is unbelievably cruel to force vulnerable people into yet more debt just for routine treatment. Like I brought up in the police section, Gihun has seen firsthand how hostile the government is to anti-capitalist action. When he and his workers strike, it is violently suppressed by the police. In America, too, police and private contractors like Pinkertons have waged full-on war against unions. This all shows the brutal efficacy of the CIA's Cold War tactics, that decades later Koreans face the same problems of income inequality, personal debt, poor working conditions, parasitic insurance, etc. that we do here in the USA. In this way, Squid Game has a wide appeal to international audiences, many of whom have suffered under the same heel of American capitalist imperialism. It's almost like class struggle transcends all borders or something.
I want to explore a couple of key characters here and how they represent aspects of the individual in a capitalist hierarchy. First off is Songwoo. Cho Songwoo is a unique player. Unlike most other characters, he is high class and has led a successful life up until now. He's a childhood friend of Gihun who escaped their poor upbringing and attended Seoul National University, becoming a wealthy investor. He is now wanted for financial crimes after defrauding his clients, motivating him to join the game for a second chance. Over the course of Squid Game, he is revealed to have ruthless sociopathic tendencies and betrays many close to him for personal gain. We see this first in the second game when he learns what it is beforehand but keeps it to himself and doesn't warn his friends against picking dangerous shapes. Presumably, he hopes for them to die so he has less competition later on. In the fourth game, he once again manipulates his teammate, one of his closest friends at this point, into losing. This time, he is successful. In the fifth game, he murders another player with his bare hands to get ahead. And the night before the sixth game, he once again murders, this time a defenseless injured girl. So what does this say? Is he just a villain? For the majority of the series, he is doted upon by Gi-hoon and others, praised for his intelligence, his success. The truth is that those who succeed in the every-man-for-himself capitalist economy are incentivized to put personal gain above the well-being and even lives of others. To win in capitalism, you have to exploit others. Whether he was born with a lack of morals and rewarded for this, or was indoctrinated into these ways as he rose through academia in his career, it leaves this ambiguous. But in both the game and real life, those that are willing to sacrifice others for every inch gained are rewarded, and this behavior is even incentivized. And all along, they keep the appearance of a high-class, educated gentleman. Songwoo is perceived as gifted and a boon to the team, up until he stabs them in the back one by one. He serves as a warning not to revere the rich and successful, not to believe they have some divine quality that got them to where they are. In reality, it is often luck and a lack of empathy that gets you to the very top. In America, and surely Korea too, we see an almost religious reverence of our billionaires, a reverence that is wholly undeserved. He gets a little redemption arc in the last episode. At the last minute, he kills himself so that Gi-hoon can win the money and care for his family. A little late though, don't you think? Songwoo attempts to kill or kills just about every friend he has throughout the series. I certainly don't forgive him. Kong Saibyok is worth mentioning as well. One of the most sympathetic characters in the series, Saibyok is a North Korean defector who is playing the game to get enough money to smuggle the rest of her family to South Korea. Despite having escaped to the wealthy South, she now lives on the streets and has to resort to pickpocketing to survive. Her little brother who came with her is in an orphanage as she cannot provide for him. Notably, in one scene, she is asked whether her life is better in South Korea, and she doesn't have an answer. <laughs> 여기가 나은 줄 알고 그래서 내가 나 가족은 to me, this is a really big deal for media produced under capitalism. It is super bold to dare to compare a developed nation like South Korea to North Korea. But it's true, life on the lowest rung of the deliberate hierarchy that capitalism builds has got to suck. Even compared to a disastrous communist state like North Korea, she is hard pressed to pick a side. We see here that the total wealth of a nation, or the state of those at the very top, maybe isn't the end-all be-all of measuring quality of life. Saibyok also, of course, faces discrimination and abuse from others, just for being an immigrant. Even though, you know, she's literally still Korean, just from the north side. Abdul Ali is another undocumented immigrant, this time from Pakistan. He's joined the game because his employer is stealing wages from him and his family is running out of money. Wage theft is an enormous problem that is hardly ever discussed, and doubly so for undocumented immigrants who have zero legal recourse against their employers. He also accidentally shoves his boss into industrial machinery as he's trying to get the money he's owed. King. Ali is the strongest and kindest character in Squid Game, and he saves his teammates repeatedly. He feels like an anti-stereotype of brown migrants, just to fuck you to people who think they're bringing dirt and crime into the country. People who refuse to acknowledge that immigrants literally have a lower crime rate than natural born US citizens. Wait, except for the part where he accidentally assaults his boss. I give him a pardon for that though. Ali is, of course, taken advantage of in the game as well. After Ali wins a 1v1 game, Songwoo convinces him that there is a way for them to both win and survive. Trusting him, Ali plays along, but Songwoo uses this trust to steal victory and have him killed. Just like Ali's employer, Songwoo exploits his vulnerability and leaves him behind. 
This also, once again, shows off Sangwoo's capitalist skills. Like Sai Byok, Ali as an immigrant is at a great disadvantage in society, and instead of showing him compassion, those above exploit his goodwill and leave him for dead. Late in the series, the game is revealed to be run by an elite cabal of ultra-wealthy, ultra-creepy old men. It is presented that they have more wealth than they know what to do with, so they spend it on twisted entertainment in the effort to try to feel something. Capitalist pursuit is ultimately meaningless. After your needs are met, what do you do with more money? To find peace with where you are and be satisfied with what you have, you would have to admit that the vicious exploitation you engaged in to get where you are was pointless and immoral. The game is also an attempt at justifying to themselves what they've done. Capitalists desperately want to believe that human nature is to be cruel and selfish, that they're just acting how they're supposed to. The masturbatory display of forcing poor people to fight each other like crabs in a bucket is reassurance that everything they've done is normal. They just did a better job and came out on top. Honestly, the VIPs are not the most vital addition to the story, they're just a personification of the system. Squid Game is stronger when it presents the system as faceless. It feels more like they've wanted to show who's running the game for world building reasons, which is fine. The message they embody is already well established without them, and their poor acting does not help things. Well, if I can't do 69, I'll try 96. <laughs> <laughs> What the VIPs want to believe, what all capitalists want to believe, is that human nature is inherently violent, traitorous, and selfish. Squid Game brings this up again and again. It mirrors the rhetoric of capitalists in the real world. It's human nature, so just embrace selfishness and reward it. Communism would never work. It forces people to go against their nature. This discourages any attempts to improve conditions. This is the best it can get, they say. You have to play the game. Obviously, this is bullshit. It's constantly refuted by the protagonists, and even antagonists, as they show compassion and help their fellows. Songwoo's last act is one of selflessness. Sai Byok's opponent volunteers to die, as she has no family, and Sai Byok does. Ali never hurts a single soul, showing kindness and gratitude to everyone around him. Except for his manager, I guess. ki himself shows remarkable compassion to his fellow players, and does his best to build a team to weather the games together. I declare that the capitalists are wrong. Human nature is to form bonds, to build together. This is why we have societies, technology, language. Do you know that the most developed part of our brains are the language centers? They are freakishly large, evolved specifically to allow us to collaborate, share knowledge, build an understanding of the world together to collectively survive. We are a social species and that is our strength. All the evil in Squid Game comes from people trying to survive in a capitalist system that only rewards selfish and exploitative behavior. In the game, this is obvious early on, as they deliberately goad the players into a fight by limiting food and then slyly revealing that killing each other between games results in the same prize money bonus as in-game deaths. There's a pre-planned murder night with lighting effects and everything. If murder is human nature, why do you need to incentivize it with carefully constructed games? Hmm? The real-life equivalent to all this is exploiting the labor of others. It's not human nature to be a landlord sitting back with the deed to a home and letting poor people give you half their income. It's not human nature to be a CEO and make millions of dollars for making a couple decisions a day. The world is this way because people set it up this way. The game is artificial. Capitalism is artificial. We can replace it with whatever we want. There are better alternatives. The climax of this discussion is a final bet, where the creator of the game wagers that nobody will help a homeless man freezing to death on the road. For all his confidence, he's wrong. The human nature myth is just something exploiters say to feel better about themselves. They want to believe that better things are not possible, that what they're doing is natural, and it would happen anyway. Because if they're wrong, and it's not human nature to exploit, then they'd actually have to face the morality of what they're doing be that forcing poorers to fight to the death, or stealing surplus value from the labor of others. Anyway, even if it was indisputable that human nature is to be 100% selfish, that's still the naturalistic fallacy. Destroyed with facts and logic. You can read Squid Game in different ways. If I were a dumbass capitalist, I might think that this show is just a somber look at the necessary evils of modern society. 
I've seen people say, wow, this show really proves that money is the root of all evil. That's bullshit. Money is just an abstraction of value so we can run society more easily. The root of evil comes from a system in which you are forced to sell your soul and body to survive, or to subjugate and exploit your fellow man for profit. Capitalism forces the worst of all of us to the surface, punishes you for selflessness, bleeds the less privileged dry. Would any of the players of the game engage in these evil acts if their basic needs were met? If their families were housed and fed and healthy? If they had access to a job that treats them well? With basic humane socialist structures, we could remove every factor that motivated these players to play the game. Sure, there'd be some psychos that would kill and die for the chance at a luxurious billionaire lifestyle, but it's telling that the game doesn't recruit financially secure people. It can't. It can only recruit people in the most desperate circumstances. The type of circumstances that motivate people to do terrible things in the real world. Crime and depravity is not a moral failing. It's a systemic failing. The system is all-consuming, impossible to escape. Everyone who tries in the show fails. Upward mobility always comes at the expense of others. Starting a small business requires exploiting the labor of your employees to make a profit, and winning the game likewise requires everyone else to be pushed down. Gihun feels this pessimism for a full year, even after coming away victorious and winning the game. Filled with guilt, he doesn't even try to use his winnings for good. He doesn't help the families of the other players, he just mopes around. Squid Game is super pessimistic overall. It is somber. It doesn't hold back, doesn't sugarcoat. But it also holds out that human nature is good, even if the system is bad. We see throughout, characters show each other kindness and make existence more bearable, even trapped in this nightmare. After the final bet, Gihun is reminded of the positive aspects of human nature, and finally uses his winnings to help the needy families of his dead friends. Now, this is a slightly lackluster takeaway. The show almost seems to say that systemic change is hopeless, that the only way to make things better is individual acts of charity. This is also what capitalists in real life try to promote, that this is the best it's going to get, and the best way to help the poor is to support charities rather than reform the systems that keep them oppressed. This is odd considering how radical the rest of the show is. It doesn't shy away from heavy-handed messages, but completely fails to take the next step and address what can be done to dismantle capitalism. It is for this reason that I find the show to be extremely bleak and pessimistic overall. In addition to the personal tragedies, as lovable characters are killed one after another, the overarching message is one of systemic hopelessness. <sighs> I deliberately avoided talking about the final 10 seconds of the show. In a bizarre twist that seems to fly in the face of everything established until this point, Gihun decides to abandon his family once more and try to single-handedly dismantle the game. What? This contradicts the previous themes. We see everyone who tries this is killed swiftly. Junho utterly fails to expose the show. Gihun himself, when his workplace strikes, faces vicious suppression from the police. If he tries this, there's every reason to expect he will be killed as soon as he gets anywhere near the game. So what's the deal with this ending? It's possible this is just sequel bait forced in by Netflix to an otherwise conclusive story. It certainly feels like it. Compared to an otherwise grimly pragmatic narrative, this feels like something out of a kid's movie. On the other side, it could be that the show actually wants to talk about what it failed to talk about in the first season. What can be done to improve and eventually dismantle the system? This would be a great thing for the second season to center around. The oppressive nature of capitalism has been well established, so now let's tell a story of class solidarity, organization, and revolution. But it doesn't feel like that's where it's going, does it? All of Gihun's friends and fellow players are dead, defeated by the game. He sets off alone to single-handedly solve the problems with the power of individualism or something. For it to work, I guess he'd need to find the next set of players and help them orchestrate a revolution. I don't know, it feels messy. I don't think they thought this through honestly, and the writer of the show says he has no plans to write a second season. Overall, this ending is a bizarre affront to the rest of the very good season. The entire final episode is a bit meandering, and I think the ending would have been much more powerful if it had concluded as soon as Gihun had won the game, perhaps with the final bet sequence tacked on after the credits. It doesn't say much of anything that hasn't already been said, and it's the weakest point of the series by far. Squid Game is a radical piece of pent-up resentment, and I respect it for its honesty and boldness. 
It says a lot that this is the show resonating most with audiences and rising to the top of the charts. If Republicans were less fucking stupid, they'd cry about the actual Marxist propaganda in shows like Squid Game rather than the imaginary Marxist propaganda in preschools or whatever. But they can't do that because Squid Game is such a convincing piece that you can't watch it and not be convinced that economic reform is good and necessary. It falls short when it comes time to provide solutions, but I mostly forgive it for that. Especially for such a high-quality, expensive, well-produced show, it's more than enough to satisfy me that it includes really powerful, angsty Marxist overtones. I don't even know if this is a review or just a thought piece. Who knows? 17 out of 19. Good show. Watch it. Thank you so much for watching. This is the first time I've made a video essay. I hope it was fun. If you were wondering why I used a virtual avatar, it's because I thought it would be more interesting than staring at my face for an hour. I used my home-built VTuber app to do the cool custom animation. Once again, I know this was very out-of-the-ordinary content for my channel. I'll be back with some fresh Vertigo 2 videos soon, don't worry.